You're listening to Revolution Radio, where it's 53 degrees, and I've got Joe Ananaki on the phone. Hey, Joe, what would you like to hear? We are observing your Earth. I'm sorry, Joe, but we can't... And we'd like to make... Uh, sorry, Joe, but... A contact uh, with you. Collision Court. It is essential for our survival to use these powerful tools in the most humane and wise way. And the only way to guarantee that is not to shuffle the responsibility off to somebody else, but to make sure that every citizen understands science and technology to some extent. Lighten up, Francis. Francis. Good evening, everyone. It's Francis for another episode of Collision Course right here on FreedomSlips.com Revolution Radio. It's 8 p.m. in New York City. For the next two hours, you're going to hear me and my wonderful guest, Ed Guinan. Uh, for the interview, we're going to talk about Beetlejuice, but for right now, we're just going to cover what's going on. Hey, welcome to Collision Course right now and every Sunday from 8 to 10 p.m. right here on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Clear skies, everyone. It's your host, Francis of Collision Course. You're going to come here every Sunday at this time, and I'm going to tell you a little bit, a bit about what's going on in our solar neighborhood. But if you know me, it's not just that. We're on a mission to uncover and discover the truth about our place in the universe. You're going to come here and listen for some interviews. You're going to come here and listen to me. Either way, we're going to know more so we can decide what's real and what is not in the space outside our atmosphere. Hey, everyone, it's Francis for another episode of Collision Course. We have a great guest. I'm going to drag him right in. Uh, and we're just going to go right ahead and have this discussion about Beetlejuice. We're going to say hello to everyone at the top of the next hour. Or so at 9 p.m., we're going to go through the chat room and say hello to everybody. But welcome, welcome, welcome. You're going to enjoy this show. Let me go ahead and add in our uh, guest for this evening, uh, Mr. Edward Guinan. Guinan, I hope I'm saying that correct, from Villanova. I'm going to add him in, and we're going to get going right on this discussion. Beetlejuice, because Beetlejuice has been on uh, on the news, in the news, and Ed's going to help us with his knowledge about what's going on with Beetlejuice. Mr. Guinan, Mr. Everett Guinan, are you there with us? Hello, Ed? Yes, hello, Francis. Hello, hello, good evening, and how are you? I'm good, and you? I'm doing fine. Thank you so much for coming on Collision Course and speaking to me about this wonderful to- topic that we're going to talk about, Beetlejuice, this evening. Um, get uh, everyone who's listening. This is my guest, Mr. Ed. Am I saying it right, Guinan, or is it Guinan? It's Guinan. Oh, I was totally getting it wrong, and I apologize. Edward Guinan, uh, from Villanova uh, University. Um, I can tell you right away. I have a little bit of, of uh, a little bit about you, Ed. If you just hold on for one second, let me tell everyone about you. Everyone, Ed is a professor in Vin- Vin- Villanova University Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. He and two colleagues observed evidence of Neptune's ring system back in 1968, which was later discovered and confirmed by Voyager two in 1989. Uh, besides that, he's been and continues to be involved in various international astronomical collaborations. He's received a BS degree in physics from Villanova in 1964. In 1970, he received his doctoral degree in astronomy from the University of Pennsylvania. If anybody, uh, any one of my listeners has been following along in this interesting story about Betelgeuse, you will have probably come across Ed Guinan's name, him and his colleagues, Rick Wasatonic. And we have another uh, amateur astronomer who I just ran into his name earlier. But everyone, let's welcome uh, Ed to the show. I'm going to clap, Ed, because thank you so much for coming this evening. I'm so happy to talk about this topic. It's true, though. It's totally true. I, this comes totally straight from the heart. And and what's great about this show is that all the listeners are really from the heart uh, um, listening to this information. And they come to the show because they know I, I try to bring them, the scientists who are doing the, the most recent, or if they read your name in the article, they want to talk to you. They want to hear from these folks. I want to hear from them, too. Uh, and that would mean you. So, you. can we talk about Beetlejuice? Sure. Uh, because it'd be easy to say, well, there's a star out there in the Ryan's constellation. Can we can we start at, like, maybe the birth of Beetlejuice? Because I know that Beetlejuice 
uh, is what it is. But there's some interesting information about it. Um, let's start with where our idea is. Where did Beetlejuice be come from? Oh, that's an unusual thing. Uh, it was uh, born in the Orion Nebula region, uh, in the center of the constellation, and it was kicked out. It, it was ejected, uh, you know, like maybe four or five a million years ago. Probably it had an encounter with another star. So it's kind, it's kind of a loner. Almost all young stars uh, and massive stars like Betelgeuse are in clusters. And Betelgeuse isn't. So it, it had some sort of an encounter with another star. And uh, we were able to trace that. Graham Harper from University of Colorado, we traced it back uh, to its origin. And it was in the, uh, in the, uh, the nebular region of uh, the belt. It's kind of cool. That so. is kind of cool because for uh, amateur astronomers and astronomers like myself, visual uh, astrophotographers, we all know where M42 is, the yes. great Orion Nebula. And all I can see of is the triangulum inside of the great Orion Nebula when you take an image. And this is visual if you have a, a, a telescope. Um, you don't even need a very big telescope to look at M42. And you'll be able to see those four triangulum type star area and some nebulosity if you're just using a smaller telescope. But now we can imagine that Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse, even though now it's far away, and I'll tell everyone, it's traveling at about 32,000 kilometers a second away from where it started. Mm -hmm. And so now it's residing in Orion's shoulder. So I wanted to get some of that information out for everybody because this is a young star, but it's not it's not locked in place. It's, it's moving. It's cool. Um, mm -hmm. How about age? And, and why why... When people hear about the age, are they surprised? Even I was surprised. Okay. Well, uh, e massive stars. Betelgeuse is a massive star, somewhere around 12 times the mass of the sun, plus or minus two, two times. Uh, so young stars uh, or massive stars have short lives. Uh, the lifetime predicted for uh, Betelgeuse is 10 million, nine to 10 million years. So it's as if, you know, if you think of the sun whose lifetime is, is 10 billion years, and you make that like 100 human years, a Betelgeuse lifetime in human years in that, in that kind of scale is a month. So it, it doesn't live very long, but it, it's, it shines bright and goes out with a flash. Does it size, does, because it's so large, that basically affects its lifespan? No, no, it's mass is what affects the lifespan. That's uh, that's the major thing. You can uh, if a, when stars are born, if you were an insurance agent, you just weigh them, and you can tell how long they're 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 going going to live. So Betelgeuse weighs in. It was probably even more massive in the past. You weigh them, and the mass determines the whole uh, future, how long the star will uh, will live. Because if you're insurance, if you're insuring stars, you'd be able to uh, to uh, compute that pretty well. So Betelgeuse has probably, it's been computed uh, uh, somewhere around 100,000 to 200,000 years left before it blows up. It could, I mean, any, any time from now to about 200, 100 to 200,000 years, it's, it's, run, it's run its gamut of life. And the reason there's uncertainties is because the distance of the star is hard to measure. Again, we, uh, a colleague of mine, Graham Harper from Colorado, he, he, he has a program where he measured it with the VLA, uh, in radio, combined it with, uh, Hipparchus measurements, and he comes up with, um, a number like 700 light years. And that's what we, we think it is, about 700 light years away. And that determines, like, the uns but it has an uncertainty of like 10%. That uncertainty, you know, car if a star is further away, it's more luminous. And that is the way you kind of how you figure out what the mass of the star is and how evolved it is. So it, it, the slop in determining when it's going to die or the uncertainty is, is due to the uncertainty and the luminosity, how bright the star is, its mass. Uh, and and that, that's why you don't know exactly uh, when, it, when it's going to happen. It could have happened already, you know. <laughs> 
Well, of course, that is something everyone is coming to grips with, is that considering how far away it is, six or seven hundred light years away, if anything has occurred or if we're going to see light tomorrow, it will have already occurred six or seven hundred years ago. I was going to ask a question as you were replying to that, um, because this word is going to come up probably again. The word, everyone, is interferometer. Oh, interferometer. Interferometer is when you put two telescopes, you separate two telescopes, and it it, it allows a larger art, uh, uh, aperture. Uh, what inter, uh, How you resolve stars is just the size of the telescope gives you better resolution of the star. And Betelgeuse is a big star in, in terms of its uh, angular size. It's almost uh, 50 milli arc seconds, uh, which, is, which is large for a star. And uh, so the, it was, uh, in fact, this is the anniversary of the first interferometric measurement. This is where you have, what they did is they had the 100-inch telescope, and they put two uh, mirrors and extended the telescope. Instead of making it 100-inch, they made it uh, 200 inches, and it increased the resolution. They were able to measure the diameter. Uh, and that was done in 1921 out in California. So they had a... Um, they had a anniversary, 100th anniversary of the first measurement of a star's diameter, and it was Betelgeuse because it's easiest to do. Uh, it was done in uh, California, and at the American Astronomical Society meeting, there was a, a, a focus meeting uh, about that. Were they ever able to do a parallax with interferometers? No, no. Okay. It's not so easy to do. Parallax is uh, this. I mean, if, if Betelgeuse were faint, if it were, you know, ten to, say one hundredth as faint, its parallax would be nailed uh, by Gaia. Uh, it would be better than one one percent. The trouble with Betelgeuse with parallax is, is that it, it has you know, has size. It has dimensions. Most stars are point sources, so they're easy, you know, to pinpoint where they're uh, they're located in the sky and how they move. Betelgeuse is. Is 50 or so milliard seconds across, and it's also not symmetrical entirely. So when they measure these, it produces uh, some uncertainties in the uh, parallaxes. Hipparchus measured its parallax, but uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in that. And, and, and so what, what my colleague did, Harper did, is that he went on and observed, he combined the Hipparchus data with VLA, the radio, because you get very good radio positions, um, and combined those and got the distance of 700 light years instead of the 600 light years. So that's where, but 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 it's rough. It's rough. It's hard hard to measure. We're thinking in a few years we'll go back and try it again in the radio and uh, see if we can find the uh, the exact parallax. And for the listeners who are following, uh, we were just kind of talking about parallaxes when you use two, two different locations to look at something at the same time and try to determine its location and uh, in space time. And then um, the interfer- interferometers I'm going to bring in because I'm going to bring in uh, information from Nobel Prize winner Dr. Charles Towns. Yeah. Because, of course, before our dimming, you know, as I'm doing my informational research, Dr. Towns did uh, his research prior and up to, you know, 2003 or so when he when he passed. Now, let's go with what you know most uh, about, and that would be the dimming. And the most reporting that you did, you've, well, you right now have three um, astronomer telegraphs uh, all about the dimming of Betelgeuse, yeah. the latest one on Jan- yeah. January 20th. Can yeah. you tell us? Tell us about what you what you've been dealing with and what information is coming out okay. regarding this. Well, I started observing the star when I was a little child in 1981. Not not really, <laughs> but uh, so it, I was fascinated by it. And we did it from Villanova because we took it, we chose it because it's variable, varies in brightness, and the main reason it was bright. We, we have parking lot lights in near a city, so we chose very bright stars, and Betelgeuse was one of them. And then we continued it in earnest in 1995. My colleague Rick Wasatonic, using his home telescope and observatory that's in his backyard, uh, uh, started to observe it using special filters. Um, 
he does it with um, a diode. It's a it's a it's an older old fashioned kind of detector, but it can see out into the uh, the IR region, the, the infrared. So we we have it in visual, which is what your eye would see, and then we have infrared filters uh, that cover the titanium oxide bands because uh, that can give you what the temperature of the star is. Then we have a filter that's lime free out at one micron, that's 10,000 angstroms, uh, that we use to measure bolometric magnitude, and that gives the luminosity of the star. So with these filters that we're using, uh, we're able to determine what the temperature of the star is, how, what, how, what the luminosity is, not the brightness in the V filter. The V filter is messed up. The V filter has, this is the, the visual filter, it has so many titanium oxide lines that what you're really measuring there is temperature rather than how bright the star is. So we have a system where we can measure its uh, its luminosity or changes the luminosity. Then we can, we can compute radius uh, from that. It's just luminosity is equal you know, pi uh, r squared, radius of the star squared. Sigma is a constant t to the fourth. So that's what we're doing. It's very, very simple. So we know the temperature. And we know the luminosity, so you solve for R for the for the disc for the radius. That's what we've been doing. So we've been doing this for 25 years. Um, uh, we have 25 years of of data um, that, and the star varies. It has. Um, you know, we 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 broke it up in, into different seasons and different years, and found periods. There's a kind of a main period that hangs around. It's about 420 days. Uh, there's another period of five years, and it has other ones. So it has multi kind of periods going on. It's it's not maybe not pulsating, but it, it's uh, maybe it's non radial pul- pulsations. But it might have blobs of material rising up and falling back, um, creating changes in in light. Some of them may be periodic. So we were, you know, we were getting tired of it. It, would, it, the, the, it was going up to about 0.3 magnitudes, brightest, and down to about one magnitude in the 25 years. And, you know, we've been there for 25 years, and we were going to stop it this year. And I said, you know, if we, st- we, we thought, we'll do it one more year, because if you stop it, the star, you know, the star will know and do, and do something. And so we continued it, and then it looked okay. I mean, it was, um, it was about 0.6 magnitude in September. It started to, to drop. You know, that's what it was kind of supposed to do following this 425-day period. But it was only supposed to drop to a three tenths, twenty thirty percent. So in December it was below one magnitude, and then in December you know, tenth or so it was one point one. So I decided to send a telegram out. That was the, that's where the attention. The telegram is called astronomers' telegrams. These are just announcements, mainly to other astronomers, that something's up. You know that you might want to uh, consider. Uh, observing the the star, and lots of times these are supernova, or they're novae, or they're comets, or new discoveries of bursters and things like that. They're not really meant for the public. They're meant for other astronomers to look at them and then say, "Yeah, maybe I'll do this star." So then it got it got on. A person from National Geographic uh, saw the telegram, interviewed me, and then it got out that the star was behaving unusually. So we wrote a second <laughs> telegram, and, and it's, it's been a barrage. Uh, the second telegram was, it, we thought it was going to stop. I kept saying, well, this is it. It's it's not going to go any lower. It's never done it. So it broke its brightness, dimness record, I guess. We call it the fainting, the fainting of Betelgeuse. Um, and they played around with that. A faint is having a fainting spell. So the second telegram came out a couple of weeks later because it was now down uh, below, fainter than it's ever been seen. Because we went back and checked all the data from uh, there's an organization called the AAVSO, which some of your um, some of your listeners are probably members of the Variable Star Variable right. Star Observers, yeah where they do visual estimates, which I just did before I started this interview. I just peeked outside to see if Betelgeuse was still there. <laughs> <laughs> see what you started, though, Ed? Do you see what you started? And This is what I'm going to say about it. It's a good thing, because you know why? Because anything that gets people to look up, anything that gets people to think about outer space and, and our place in the universe even if it's unique and interesting and maybe their 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 
stretching it, I don't mind. So uh, I'll tell you that I put up, you, you shared with me the graph, uh, the Alpha Ori graph the other day, where you see the dramatic drop off to okay. 1.6. And then um, I linked into the Astronomer's Telegram, too, so the listeners and those in the chat room have an opportunity to see okay. what we're talking about. Because when you got past 1.3, you were really in a no a no zone. And, 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 you know, I was reading an article. An article wanted to say, oh, well, we've only been watching Betelgeuse for 100 years. Well, I read back, you know, all the way to aboriginals. You know, the Australian aboriginals have a whole historical data about Betelgeuse. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a famous story. It goes back, you know, uh, Hipparchus, uh, the, the Greek Hipparchus observed right. it in Ptolemy, and so it has a history, but not uh, not very accurate uh, observations. But they do go back uh, to to two thousand years, and it was a bright star back back then. So uh, let me ask you. Yeah. Let me ask you. Uh, here we are. Here we stand. Uh, one twenty six, twenty twenty. We just looked at the Alpha Ori graph, where we're down to one point six in magnitude. And I'm not asking you to forecast. I guess what we're, what we're going to do is we're just going to look at the two options. Um, and then we're going to have a question. Option one, Betelgeuse continues to, to lose its luminosity. Option two, Betelgeuse regains luminosity back to a normal zone. Uh, right. Explain one where Betelgeuse falls off the chart or continues to do that. <sighs> That's the one we don't know. <laughs> the other one, when if it, and, and the test is right now. Uh, if it's following this 420-day period, and but much deeper, we don't know what's causing this drop. Um, then it should recover. It should be near the bottom. Should level off and start to slowly rise back up like a sine curve. And that's what we expect it to do. And it should be now. Then now is the time. This is it. In the next. Uh, Two to three weeks, or even before that, it should start to slowly rise. If it keeps going down, like 1.6, 1.7, uh, then I don't know. All bets are off. Then it, it, it could be some harbinger. It could be so, something weird going on in the, in the atmosphere of the star. I would go with that first. Uh, let me throw the, let me throw something out here from, well, what I thought was left field. And, you know, because I have so many friends, uh, that we just, we just communicate and talk astronomy and questions just like this. Is there a potential for a molecular cloud to have moved in between us and Betelgeuse? Not really, but it has molecular clouds around it. You know, it has its. its right. but this is a separate one. This is. I a say ma- a separate oh, no, one. No, that's right. That would be probably not. They go. St- they much. They go much too too slow. This is happening fast. Okay. But, but around the star, if you ever took an infrared picture or look at it on the on Google, uh, the whole area it has ejected. There's a big nebulosity around the star. That mm-hmm. if you put the Betelgeuse where the sun is. The, the, the surface is out around where near Jupiter for AU. And then it extends out to Neptune and you know, Uranus and Net Neptune, this clouds, because it has ejected. It's, it has episodes in the past that weren't observed, uh, where it has ejected material. Uh, supergiants do that. They blow off. They have, uh, 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 episodes where they blow off gas. And, you know, the thing's losing. The star is losing about one Earth mass per year, and that's pretty. Although okay. that's the stars are very large, so that doesn't hurt it very much. But over its life, it maybe has lost um, three or four uh, masses of of the sun. You know, so the star is so around it. There's there's all this complex um, nebula and things like that. And yes, there could be something like that. Some some dust, maybe some gas was ejected. And uh, it would have carbon in it. Then it, it expanded out and cooled enough that molecules formed. And that's what's dimming it now. That's what one, uh, uh, I think her name is uh, Bird, the doc- Dr. Bird from Yale maybe, uh, s- suggested that. That's not off, off the table. Uh, it's, it's possible it's doing that. We don't think it is because we, we were measuring – titanium oxide which comes from the photosphere of the star and it's indicating that the star is star itself the temperature of the star has dropped about 100 degrees 
during this interval, and the color of the star has changed. Both of those are indicating that these changes are coming from the inner part or the star itself and not a gas cloud or a con- condensation of material around the star, but you never know. And But what's what triggered, let me get back to the telegram, what the telegram was sent out was to get other astronomers with big telescopes uh, or ra- and radio telescopes and things like that to observe. And there's a thing in astronomy called director discretionary time. Um, because normally you have to apply, you know, a year in advance or six months in advance to get uh, to get data. So there's a 10% of the time is held back for things like if a, if a comet appears or a nova or uh, uh, something like like that, something that wasn't predicted. Then they uh, give you the time. So the telegram has stimulated uh, people applying for uh, time with the VLA because uh, Betelgeuse is a radio star. Uh, so they've they've applied for director discretionary time. Another group has VLT I, the interferometer in um, in Chile, uh, the European Space um, not European the European Southern Observatory, and they got time. They asked for discretionary time, and they're going to image it with the interferometer down there uh, and, and a device called Sphere. So they're, they'll have a really good shot and they're doing it, I think, this week or next, next week. And we're writing, uh, I got contacted yesterday by a colleague from the Space Telescope Science Institute, HST, that he's writing a proposal to observe it in the ultraviolet. Um, this is director discretionary time again to compare it to how it was in 2011. There was an ultraviolet spectrum taken of the star. Uh, showed carbon monoxide lines and so observe it again in the state compare it and maybe that will be a clue uh to what's happened so the telegram worked it worked more than i expected it to in terms of getting uh a publicity and and i'm in a rush to try to get a paper published you know in in a week or two uh, rather than these telegrams i don't want to continue sending out these telegrams uh so that that's that's where we are you know uh, we we're analyzing our, we've analyzed our data uh 10 years of data i think that's what i sent sent you but we have to do all the other uh, the titanium the temperature titanium oxide the temperature luminosity and plot all those you know versus time and then analyze them uh to see what's going on let me um, ask a little bit, uh, just some questions again, because, <clears throat> you know, I really feel like we have to combine the the size and the dimming. Maybe uh, we were talking uh, quickly about uh, tr- trying to tell or inform the listeners and listeners what we have with Betelgeuse is, one, here's something interesting. When you look at Betelgeuse with the Hubble, it's the only star that isn't a point of light. You can literally get a... a, a, a you can actually see its edges because then, of its size yeah. and its location. You can see a um, yeah. And pretty much that surface isn't a sphere. It, it is uh, not smooth all the way around, and that's the way it is. The next I want to ask about, again, is Dr. Charles Towns, because what I got from his research, okay, 15 years, uh, 1% for each year, give or take, uh, a shrinkage in size. If uh, Betelgeuse reaches out to Jupiter, then we're talking about approximately the size of Venus's orbit and loss. Now, that takes us just about to 2003. And if you look at... uh, like information about Betelgeuse, nothing really comes out of the news uh, stories until like 2009 when they go back and they look at that. Now, I, I just want to ask you, do you have continued research about the loss of size from like, let's say, 2003 till present? Are we, again, are we, are we at 30% loss of size from then till now? Is it continuing to lose its shape? And then the follow-up question. If it's losing size, is it potentially shedding more material, potentially creating that dusty cloud? And for the listeners, what we have is Betelgeuse is a star, but so so far from its surface, there's a distance between its surface and then there's a whole dusty area that, that encompasses this. And because it's moving at the speed we talked about, it also has a bow shock. So there's a lot of stuff, a lot of dynamic stuff going on around Betelgeuse, but I'm, I'm trying to ask the doctor if 
do we have a continue a confirmed continuation all the way up to 2020 that is continuing to lose that one percent every year Francis, you've done your, your homework on this. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yeah, I know. I know Charlie Towns. He uh, he, he was awarded our our highest award at, at Villanova, the Mendel Prize in 1994 or five. Uh, nice guy. Uh, this the observations the shrinking was was 15 percent. So it wouldn't take it back to Venus's orbit. It would just move it in uh, if it's true. Uh, it turns out that he published a paper about six months later than that. I had you, know, you, you gave me a head, heads up on this, uh, so I, I did some research on it. They observed it in the uh, the, in, the infrared at uh, eleven point something, eleven point four microns, and uh, star sizes. Now he did it. They 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 kept the wavelength the same, so there was a change uh, in, over that interval of time. We checked our data. We have data at the same time. We didn't see any change in light, you know, uh, or anything unusual going on that would in- indicate shrinking. Uh, it's it's very uh, the the diameter measurements are very wavelength dependent. The shorter the wavelength, the smaller the star appears. The larger the wavelength, you're looking more and more out in the extended. Uh, circumstellar regions. So the explanation for I don't I don't think it happened. <laughs> In other words, uh, he had a paper out with a with a colleague named Ravi a year later um, that uh, was trying to explain it as possibly due to like uh, uh, dust uh, in the circumstellar. Um, Envelope. This thing has a very complex circumstellar structure. Yes. And the wavelength they're looking at, uh, there could have been grains there. Uh, so what they were looking at was uh, kind of a change in size, but it wasn't a change in size of the star itself. It was affecting their measurement uh, that it made it look like the star was was shrinking. In other words, what happened is that's uh, in this shell where the IR where they were looking. Uh, changes were taking place that when they um, analyzed the inter- interferometry, it looked like the star was shrinking. But then they went back and reevaluated that again, and then they came up with other other ways of explaining it. Of course, it could have shrunk. It isn't shrinking anymore. They just measured the the, inter- the interferometry, uh, and it's it's what it was in the 90s. Uh, so. And before he took these uh, measurements, so this is a tricky measurement. They have a very good uh, device. They they could they could measure diameter very well, but they were using the IR area, which is good, which is great. Uh, but that is that is including gas and dust around the star, uh, or it's being perturbed by 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 that. So it, it's up for grabs whether it it shrunk there. We didn't see any changes in light of fifteen percent. If the radius really changed by 15 percent, uh, the luminosity would change uh, also because uh, the radius is, is the square. The luminosity is the square of the radius of the star. We didn't see anything that uh, correlated with, with that change. We looked when that paper was published. We went over our data and checked it to see if there's anything. We didn't see anything. And, but we're in the uh, we're in the optical region, and he's in the I- IR. So that is sort of an unsolved problem. Uh, uh, people don't seem to worry about it. There's a paper, last paper published one. It was 2009, with rap with him on it, which was kind of uh, suggesting other things than the star was shrinking. And the other things is the complex nature of the uh, the IR around it. I think one paper came out and said there was. Uh, that 11, 11 microns where they looked, you know, it was an area where you could have grains forming or affected by grains. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little uh, <laughs> off, off this, but that's that, that's what. No, that's, that's, it's really OK, because when I was, you know, obviously I, I was reading and doing my research the best I could that at, at the time they were spe- specifying that 11 microns because. When they were doing that, and now everyone, I want you to know the equipment and the science that was going on at this time with uh, Dr. Uh, Charles Towns. He received the Nobel Prize for lasers and masers. Yes. Um, so we're talking about him bringing some new, te- you know, this is all new technology. Um, the, these interferometers, uh, and I'm sure that 
Dr. Towns was trying to bring this new technology together to get these uh, wavelength readings. And, uh, you know, it was a, a large part of his um, later years, the, yes. these, mm-hmm. these 15 years. But just from what Ed was telling us, it's hard to get a grasp on Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse because of its environment, its local environment, um, because of the type of star it is. Um, we could all, you know, I could have started the show and say, hey, Ed, it's all about variability. See you later. And then, you know, we could we could look at it that way or we could just dive into it a little bit deeper. And that's what we're doing. We're talking about the technology. We're talking about how things were measured, which way they were measured, what we can actually trust as far as the information. And if we're going to make a forecast about that information, is it fair to forecast one way over the other? I think what we're going to still find is that it's going to be a great object to pay attention to. But um, I had another question. So we were talking about Dr. Towns in the interferometers. Oh, I had another good good one that just crossed my mind. Oh, here was so interesting. I didn't know that you actually you and Dr. Towns knew each other or yeah. came from the same field together in that same area. That's well, we true. We gave him an award. He received the. Um, we have the Mendel Medal. And he was awarded that for his work on lasers. And when he came to Villanova, to, you know, we sat at the table and talked about Betelgeuse, uh, boring everybody else, uh, because he was trying to figure out, uh, he was starting to do the observations then. He just started, it was like 95, 96, something like that. He was, a, he was an elderly man then, but very sharp. Right. Right, well, he was in his eighties, you know, when I was. Yeah, he worked till he was ninety four, I think. I believe it was ninety in his ninety fourth year, and he was still researching. Up to then, okay, I have I have a new question. I think. Yeah, I read somewhere that there was two points, two points of light or something on one side of Betelgeuse. Is it the north south pole coming together? Or is it just something that wasn't seen? Did you read anything about that? I read yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Uh, observation. Yeah. Uh, observation, maybe the poles were coming together on one side. Well, that no, I think there was a point, I think you're referring to an ultraviolet image where there's a bright spot where they think it's near the pole. Um, I don't, uh, that has not been re, re, that's been, it's true, but it hasn't been observed again. The group I'm working with is, is going to, is, is asking for telescope time, Hubble time, to observe it the same way that was done about 20 years ago. Uh, in the ultraviolet to see if that that spot is there. It's also been imaged. You know, it has it has bright uh, spots on it. So this is the only star where you can accept the sun, where you can actually uh, image the star. You don't get very much resolution. You get like four resolving elements across the star. But there's there's bright spots on it, and they they change from season to season. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that if people get time on these interferometers. They get like a night. Uh, once or twice a year, and that's not enough, and maybe they'll not do it for another year. Uh, so the star is, uh, seems to have bright spots, uh, which come and go. The theory for those was that it was, goes back to the 1950s, where, uh, Swarthschild was the famous astronomer, um, to, at, uh, Princeton, who does models of stars, uh, thought that Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse is a convective star. It's cool. So its atmosphere is unstable and it bubbles. It has giant convective cells, uh, that are like the size of the sun or bigger than the size of the sun that, that ooze up from inside. And as they ooze up, they're bright and they make the star, uh, they make the star get, get brighter. Then they cool off and sink down. The sun has these two. These are called granules. The sun's granules are the size of Texas. Uh, the granules that the Betelgeuse has is are the size of the sun or bigger than than the sun. They're huge, uh, huge cells of hot material. That's been speculated since the 1960s. And I think in the interferometry that was carried out in the 90s, in uh in the visible region showed these these features and maybe that's what we're seeing is uh is one of these uh one of these blobs that has come up and then is sinking down cooling and uh making the star dim we don't know i mean we do have radial velocities of the star 
uh, and it shows it to be since fall. But friends of mine do. Uh, this is a uh, an Austrian astronomer named Klaus Strasberg, uh, Strassmeyer, sorry, and he has a telescope that does um, does does Betelgeuse every night in spec- spectroscopy, and uh, he looked at his. Uh, his spectra and was able to see that the star was expanding or has been expanding over the last few months. So this kind of confirms that we, we measured in indirectly that the star is bigger now, uh, by, you know, by like 20, 20%, uh, than it was, uh, several months ago, not 20%, 10, 10%. Uh, so, so we were getting, all this data, what you do in astronomy today, what you have to do, you have to pull in. Um, you can't just do it with one method. You have to use many uh, methods. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of neat telescopes out, out, out there, radio telescopes, uh, the this uh, the VLTI, the Center for Omnia Radio is doing it. Uh, Hubble's going to be doing it. Uh, so when you pull all this together and ground-based and even the AAVS observers are monitoring uh, the star. When applying for the Hubble time, uh, you have to be very, you have to prove, you have to write up a safety issue. Are there safety issues with this star? So we're, we're putting in, you know, if you're observing a star that could flare, for example, uh, they won't give you the time because it could ruin their detector. So here's a star that could supernova. So we have in there, it was kind of a joke, uh, we have in there that, uh, we would know if there was a star was about to brighten. Uh, we would have that in information uh, if it starts to brighten fast uh, from the network of uh, of uh, amateur uh, variable star observers. And also the the gravity waves would get here uh, maybe two or three hours uh, before the the light broke out. And the second thing would happen is that so that it, who knows it should be detectable. Because as the thing blows up, as it blows out, the, the core, well, okay, how supernova happens, it forms an iron core after burning everything else. It goes through neon and up to silicon, silicon, silicon gives you iron. It no longer can fuse and the core collapses. And as it does so, the iron, the iron nuclei transmute into neutrons and just falls in, it, it, really fast within a quarter of a second. And that, that gravitational infall produces a shock uh, and lots of neutrinos that fly out, and that's what blows up the star. But it takes a while for the shock and for the light to get out to, you know, the the, the surface of, of the star is almost at Jupiter. So you're talking like, you know, an hour for it to make its way to or breaks out of the surface of, of the star to be to be seen, to be be the start of a supernova, so there would be a delay. I mean, you would uh, the uh, the n- n- neutrinos that are predicted to come out of this uh, are huge. Uh, the neutrino detectors uh, observed a supernova uh, 1987A in the LMC, the, the Large Magellanic Cloud. I think that got 20 detections. Uh, a friend of mine who's an expert in supernova computed that this this supernova, if it went supernova, uh, would get 25,000 uh, detections. And so these would come a little bit earlier, some people are predicting, a little bit earlier than the light and a little bit at about the same time as the, as, as the gravity waves. Uh, we're not relying on either one of those. We're kind of relying on... Uh, the visual observers, it's being observed by a lot of people. So if it, if it brightens, someone's going to notice that and report it or, 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 you know, immediately. So we have to write that in. There's safety measures we put in. You know, we have a network of observers and then uh, 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 amateurs and ourselves. And uh, also the uh, it would be tech, it would be detected first by the by the neutrino. Uh, observatories and we contacted the neutrino observatory just to warn them uh, that if it, to let us know if, if they got a burst of, of, of neutrinos because then maybe in an hour or so the light would uh, flare up. So that's kind of fun. Okay, here I'm going to step in for one second. Sure. Um, 
you said everybody, because that's exactly how it's going to occur for everyone. This is basically what we covered is what's going to happen at the moment Betelgeuse goes supernova. Um, everybody expects maybe the first thing we'll see is the light and the explosion. Well, the dynamics of an exploding star creates more than just visual light and all the x-rays and all the non-visual light that you can see. It creates two things that will probably proceed, which means get to Earth first before the light. Um, the first thing is going to be neutrinos, and everybody should know what neutrinos are. They're uh, a, a particle that moves through space, isn't affected by gravity, isn't affected by nearly anything. It keeps coming. If it, if it came from Betelgeuse, it's going to come directly from Betelgeuse. and It'll come right through us, go all the way through Earth and all the way out. Now, the only thing is we're lucky enough we have some sensors buried deep underground. They have some different ones. We'll just think of it this way. A sensor deep underground. A neutrino comes from Betelgeuse, comes through a certain amount of Earth, and it slows it down just enough that it gets a detection. Uh, Ed just told us that 25 would be a, a large amount of neutrinos detected. And he said, no, we're going to go with 25,000 if Betelgeuse goes supernova. So and th that will probably be the first thing. But now... Will we get the information that neutrinos have hit the sensors first? Probably not. No. Next thing will be gravity waves. It's going to affect time, space, and waves. And it'll, it'll, it, those waves will reach Earth, and then we'll have the LIGOs and the, the gravity wave detectors detecting them. Will we receive that information first? No. Like Ed just told us, who's it going to be? It's going to be the network of millions of astronomers, professional and uh, amateur and somewhere in the middle. Could be my father-in-law could be looking at Bell Juice. And I'm going to say, I'm going to say hello to Jersey Dolphins right now. She asked, Francis, I know you're busy, but in your opinion, should I start setting up my telescope and watching Beetlejuice? This is my answer. You, unfortunately or fortunately, may never see it explode, Jersey Dolphins, but what is a good reason to bring your telescope out. Any good reason is a good reason to bring your telescope out on a clear night. So, yes, bring it out, look around, look at Beetlejuice, look at M42 and all the great stuff in that area because right now is a great time to do it. It'll be in the sky 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock. You can go out, enjoy it, and come back in and still have a full night's sleep. Um, so let me ask you this, uh, Ed. We already got Thank an you article. For a second. You don't even need a telescope for this. No, I mean, you don't. Uh, because it's better not to have a telescope so you can have a bigger view of the sky. Right. And you you want to look at Orion, and you'll notice that Betelgeuse is kind of faint. It used to be as bright as Rigel. So just go out and look at that area, and you'll notice that something's wrong. <laughs> you know? And if you're if you're lucky, maybe you'll see it uh, blow up. You know, you want you don't need a t telescope to watch that. Although you need to tell, it'd be fun to look at the nebula and all the things around there. But uh, it's easier. It's a perfect. To, it, it's yeah. a perfect star to wish upon. I wish, I wish, I wish I might see a supernova tonight. Um, let me ask this question. Um, are there any other options than a supernova? Could it go black hole? Could it go pulsar? Just uh, well, a question. Yeah, well, it should be, well, after it explodes, uh, then it, it, you would get a remnant, expanding gas. And it would look like, you know, in a thousand years, it would look like the Crab Nebula. The Crab Nebula uh, has all these filaments and structures. That's from a star that exploded in 1054, a star similar to uh, what Betelgeuse would do. Um, so so that, that has a neutron star at its center. And this is kind of what is expected for Betelgeuse. If its mass really is around 12, 13 times the mass of the sun, the core of the star will probably be below. It you have to have the what has to be left after the explosion is about above above three or three and a half times the mass of the sun. They don't expect Betelgeuse to have to become a black hole because they expect the core after the explosion to be smaller. So it'll probably end up as a neutron star, and then. And as in the case of Tupernova 1987A, they've been watching it expand and it has rings. And just this year, they detected the neutron star from it. Um, so it will take a while because it's a mess. It will be nebulosities and dust and expanding material that you really won't get a look at the center, uh, the core, um, uh, for many years after. I mean, the neutron star is really going to be hot. But you're going to have trouble uh, seeing that uh, looking through all the material that's blowing off. 
I mean, it's coming off at like 20 percent the speed of light. So after a while, after that spreads out and expands out, uh, as, as in the case of, uh, of Supernova 1987A, uh, it took, you know, 30 uh, some years uh, for that to be uh, to, for that neutron star to be uh, uh, seen. So the same thing will be true with Betelgeuse whenever it blows. I'm not saying it's going to go tomorrow. Uh, probably not. Uh, but when it goes, it's, it's going to blow. There's no, the star has no options. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, of when it, and when it happens. And, uh, it would be, you know, I, I don't know if you got into this with your listeners, but it would be as bright as the full moon, uh, right, right around there. Um, about a, you know, a thousand times, a hundred times brighter than Venus. And then, so it'd be, when it goes, it's going to be pretty, uh, spectacular to, uh, it's going to, it's going to be beautiful, you know, just for, uh, people who like to enjoy beauty of, of, of the sky. And it would be wonderful. It happened during our life, our lifetime. It would cast shadows. You see it in the daytime. And, uh, for like a couple of months, it would rise up in about a week. And this is how supernova work. It rises up in a week and then slowly decay. Uh, the trouble with all this stuff we're doing is that there are no really good examples of what stars do on their outside, their variability and things like that before their supernova. That's the problem. Uh, all but one or two supernova have been detected after they blew up and their, the star that was the progenitor is not seen, is not measured. And so that's the problem here because I've talked to supernova experts. I said, well, what happens? What happens a year, you know, a month, a week before the supernova, before the star explodes? They don't have a, a good answer for that. They know what's going on inside the star, but they don't know how the outside is going to respond to that. One or two believe that within a year, uh, the star, if the star keeps dimming, one of the models is that it's, it's, it's starting a new mode of, uh, of nuclear burning, maybe, uh, burning neon. And, and that's near the end of its line when it's up to neon. Things go very, very fast in, in the end. Uh, I think it burns, it, it fuses silicon for like five hours and then it makes, so when it gets to that stage, it's kind of rapidly accelerating, burning, burning, during different shells are burning till it gets to the iron core and then it explodes. The iron core doesn't explode, but the iron core collapses, but the star explodes. So I, I asked if, you know, if there was, when it switched modes, when it started a new source of energy, when it went uh, like burning neon or, uh, things like that, whether there would be a pause, whether there'd be a change. And some thought maybe yes, uh, there would be a, a, a change in the, in the brightness, overall brightness of, of the stars. Others said they didn't know. I mean, most people don't, don't know. Um, cause this is going on way inside, deep inside the star, which is almost, you know, the surface is that where Jupiter is inside is where the sun is. And it's about the size of the sun, the nuclear core. Uh, they don't communicate very well. Except they do. The, the, there's so much energy coming out of the out of the nucleus of the star that we're, where the burning is taking place that you know has a luminosity 100,000 times the sun now. So it pushes the star out, uh, and that's what keeps it from falling in. So they don't know. They don't really know the theoretical people. There's a person near you in Texas who's the expert, Craig Wheeler, at the University of Te- Texas Austin, is the supernova expert. And, uh, I, I met him at, well, know, he's been a friend of mine for years. Uh, he's, he's an expert on the theory of supernova and what they do inside and how their structure changes. My, my interest was before they become supernova, uh, the progenitors, these are red supergiants to study, uh, I look at them to study, try to, to look at the variations and try to interpret what's going on inside the star, uh, probing the different periods. It, it probes what the structure of the star is like. It wasn't really the, the supernova is not my, uh, not my expertise. <laughs> so when supernovas, I'm, it, it falls into supernova uh, experts. I, I do the red supergiants. I study red supergiant stars. Ed? 
Yes. We are coming to, uh, to the top of the hour, which is 9 p.m. in New York City. It's uh, going, going on 8 p.m. here outside of Houston. I want to thank you so much for coming on this evening. I'm going to pose one more question for you. We don't know when it's going to blow up. We don't know what it's going to look like or when that time is, is coming. But between you and me and the listeners, right, it's an interesting topic. Continue following along. If something happens, listeners, we'll bring Ed back to talk some more. If he has to do another telegraph or when he <laughs> writes his paper, we're going to bring him back on. Ed, before this commercial really breaks us up, I want to thank you so much for coming on this evening. I asked for an hour of your time, and, and my hour is up. And okay. my listeners, thank you very, very much. Well, thank you for inviting me. Okay. Look, look up at Orion. <laughs> yes, and I'm gonna I'm gonna keep them looking up uh, in more ways than one. Ed, I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay. And uh, I hope to talk to you again soon. I hope something happens and we can come back again and have another discussion. But I really thank you uh, for coming on for this hour, and I wish you a wonderful evening. And thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, everyone, 7.55 p.m. where I'm at outside of Houston. This is Collision Course right here on Revolution Radio, freedomships.com. This is the number one world's listener-supported radio station, the world's number one listener-supported radio station that would love to have you support. Come on over to freedomships.com, find a donate button, and donate today. We'll re be right back on the other side of the hour. Thanks for listening. We're going to cover everything we just got done talking about. We'll be right back. 